Hi, I'm Spencer Krauss. I've been building robots for over 20 years. In that time, I've seen a lot of interesting things, and I've heard a lot of interesting stories. Collaborative with Spencer Krauss is a place where my colleagues and I can relax, have a drink, and talk about some of the crazier things we've seen at work and some of the experiences we've had that have gotten us to where we are today. Subscribe today to join the collaboration. Welcome to the Collaborative Podcast. I'm your host, Spencer Kraus. Our guest today is Tekken Marichli. Tekken is a co-founder and the former CTO of Locomation, a personal friend and a uh, mentor from grad school uh, to present. Uh, Tekken, welcome to the pod. Thank you so much for having me. Thanks for coming in. I really appreciate us doing this. I'm really excited to be hanging out with you and uh, showing, uh, you know, kind of some of what you're about to uh, people listening. That's awesome. I'm excited about that. Awesome. So I guess to get into it, like, how did you know you wanted to be in robotics? Like, when was the moment when you thought, like, I want to make robots? I actually uh, vividly remembered the moment that I decided to work on robots. Uh, so perhaps before diving into that, I, I should also mention that uh, my brother, Chetan Mirichli, has been a great role model for me throughout my life. He is my kind of lifelong collaborator in academia, in our uh, entrepreneurship uh, journeys as well. Um, and of course, being a few years ahead of me, uh, he got into a master's program first where he started working on robots. Uh, but of course, his story goes back even further. Uh, he's kind of falling in love with robots. But then following him, uh, when I stepped into the same lab and started kind of literally putting my hands on a robot and kind of moving its joints and such. And that was an, that was an Ibo, Sony Ibo uh, robot dog uh, that we so were using for like some. Early 2000s. Yeah, early 2000s, uh, 2003 to be exact. When I first kind of moved the joint and then heard that mechanical sound, I fell in love with that. And I said, okay, I'm, I'm going to do robots. Um, of course, uh, it also has its roots in kind of uh, seeing the, the outcome of your work doing something in the physical world as opposed to just like being in the virtual world like pure software engineering is uh, i think that also uh, was a big factor in me falling in love with robots same actually yeah so we we pretty much like look eye to eye on, on that front yeah no i mean when i got my undergrad degree in computer science i remember you know just like how am i going to show anyone what i'm working on <laughs> you know? yeah, like it's yeah. kind of selfish but yeah you know. i mean uh, hardware is definitely fun, uh, not easy. That's why it's called hardware, I guess. Yeah. Uh, um, it has its own troubles, uh, but I, I believe uh, those are kind of fun troubles. Uh, and uh, it's a good way to kind of push forward and advance uh, the overall, I guess, knowledge and, and uh, uh, I don't know, uh, well-being of humanity. Yeah, for sure. What made you decide to go into trucking, like uh, to zero in on that oh. problem? Yeah, so uh, it's kind of interesting. Uh, when it comes to our our entrepreneurial uh, journeys, uh, we've always looked at uh, that that problem from like a very systematic decision making process point of view. Uh, essentially, just constructing like a decision tree. Uh, around what can be done, what can we do with our skills and such, and what would be meaningful to do. So before starting Locomation, uh, myself and my co-founders were all at uh, CMU, at NREC. Uh, we were uh, either senior uh, roboticists, um, engineers, or we were kind of special faculty uh, running some of the high-profile projects uh, back at NREC. Uh, so highly skilled people technically, uh, and from a from a an entrepreneurship perspective, we could have done pretty much anything uh, regarding robotics or or autonomy or whatnot. Uh, we could do systems, we could do such components and such, and kind of try to commercialize that nugget, whatever that thing would be. But then we went through a very systematic uh, thought process, and uh, we, we said like, okay, so what would be actually meaningful to do? What would be a meaningful business? And when you look at it from that kind of a business first perspective. Uh, you need to identify 
a an actual pain point what do people suffer uh, about right or for and if you can provide a solution what would be a great business what you could actually charge for and what would be a sustainable business as well with the proper unit economics and this and that so even back then i'm talking about late 2018 uh you would actually read news about driver shortages asset underutilization increasing uh, demand uh, through like e-commerce and all that stuff but not having the the resources to kind of serve that demand right so drivers um, aging uh, newer generation is not very much interested in trucking it's a tough job you have to be away from your home uh, weeks at a time um, and uh, and uh, at the end of the day your truck as a trucker is pretty much tied to your uh, human uh, constraints like you have to uh, you can only drive for so many hours a day and you have to sleep at the end of the day and when you are tied to your truck as a driver you drive into a parking lot and you start sleeping resting and your truck and your cargo starts resting with you which <laughs> means that uh, pretty much 60 70 percent of the time a super expensive asset ie truck sits and sleeps instead of being on the road and generating miles and generating revenue so uh, it was very much apparent that some form of an autonomy solution uh, would be actually the key. Uh, we also uh, considered uh, looking into uh, robot taxis and such because that was the more popular application back then. Everybody was kind of look, uh, kind of going after the robot taxi application. But when we did the math and basic business analysis, uh, it did not make as much sense as trucking did because for us trucking an autonomy solution for trucking uh, problem would be a painkiller whereas an autonomy solution for robot taxi problem or taxi problem would be like a vitamin it's a convenience oh interesting so that, also, that's how we decided to get into trucking that's cool can i can i go back a step and examine one of the things you talked about of course so, yeah how did you do the business analysis because that that's something that i always struggle with and i feel like it feels like, you know, you just drink so many cups of coffee and you end up with all these spreadsheets and like eventually you've got, you know, a model or like a, a, a chart, you know, and like what, what were some of the things you guys did to like analyze the market and, and look at, you know, sort of the state of affairs and yeah. validate your approach? It was actually uh, another set of uh, kind of scientific process. Uh, or a bunch of hypotheses that we kind of crafted and then validated, if you will, through speaking to industry representatives, potential customers, investors, uh, and then going over each of our hypotheses one by one uh, to either put a check mark next to it or kind of strike through it, right? So, okay, so we thought it would be this and that. And then you talk to people, they either agree with you and validate your your hypothesis and you put a check mark next to it or they say no i mean you are thinking wrong that's not even a problem and then you just like do a strike through uh, so that's pretty much how we how we did that it was not a uh, very kind of traditional okay let's put lots of spreadsheets together or a 50 page business plan together i mean planning is of course uh, a, a super important uh, uh, Kind of process to run you learn a lot from it but at, uh, at the end of the day every plan is wrong and you have sure. to adjust that's why the more nimble you are the more agile you are uh, in quickly putting out a bunch of hypotheses and uh, again validating them uh, through talking to or the invalidating actual invalidating them uh, yeah. or invalidating them uh, through talking to the actual end users uh, of your of your whatever solution you are trying to build uh, I think that's that's the way to run it and that's how we ran it and we pretty much nailed a bunch of stuff right from from get-go so uh, it's kind of interesting uh, occasionally we look at our very first kind of documents like Google Doc uh, even before we had a, a name for the company it says like new call this is the business plan we <laughs> have it there and pretty much for the past like five years we have ran that business plan uh, nothing major change in that if you look at our very first pitch deck, everything is the same. Like we've pretty much nailed our plan, our our uh, 
uh, steps and actions and all that stuff. Uh, we nailed it from get go and we just executed that. Oh, cool. Yeah, no, that makes a lot of sense. Um, I uh, had an idea I was talking to uh, an end user about today, and I won't get into detail, but you know, something that might be fun to productize at some point and trying to find ideas for a certain market. And I remember talking to a potential end user and being like, oh, all this stuff I thought was a good idea was not. You know, oh, what about this? This might actually be a good idea. You know, and it, yeah. You know, it just kind of recalibrates your thinking and, and gets you um, into reality, I guess, is maybe one a way to put it. Absolutely. I mean, I think that's one of the uh, traps that that technical people like us, engineers, scientists, etc., usually fall into. Uh, I think maybe a single word description of that would be like solutionism. Or going off the deep end. Yeah, I mean, you, you have a solution, <laughs> right? So if you are an academic, for instance, uh, you have your method that you devised uh, during yeah. your, let's say, PhD or, or whatever, your academic research uh, career. And then you think that that thing is a sledgehammer and everything is like a nail. And then you try to <laughs> just like address each of those nails with your sledgehammer. Um, but in reality, things are not working like that. Uh, whatever may be great academic work may not be a good commercial product or commercialization candidate even. That's why it should actually start backwards. Instead of like going from a solution to commercialization, you should actually go and talk to customers first, figure out what is needed out in the market, and then devise a solution to that. Sometimes if you are lucky, that solution may be uh, just your sledgehammer or just yeah. your I don't know baby academic baby or whatnot but sometimes and most of the time in my opinion it requires assembling a bunch of nuggets essentially using a toolbox instead of just a sledgehammer toolbox of uh, full of different types of tools bringing them together to provide a solution to the customer to pro provide a, a product to the customer right so um, it is hard uh, when, when you are again thinking of it from a from an academics perspective, like you are essentially uh, taking off your uh, ego uh, uh, jacket and then hanging it at the door before you walk into a startup and, and try start building a product. Um, uh, but if you can do that kind of separation, then then you'll be off to a good start. Yeah, amen to that. Awesome. Yeah, <laughs> that's cool. So what was it like scaling a business to that? I mean, because you guys raised, I want, I'm trying to think of the number I remember reading. Was, I think it was like $80 million or something. Yeah, $74 million 74, okay. uh, in total. Uh, and again, uh, considering the crazy numbers uh, that are pronounced in the uh, autonomous vehicle industry, uh, uh, our total funding amount was kind of peanuts. Uh, but we knew how to stretch every single dollar. Um, uh, and with very limited monetary and, and human resources, we made tremendous progress. Uh, we announced a bunch of industry firsts, including uh, signing up for customers, uh, uh, actual contracts, actual commercial contracts. So this is really commercial trucking companies. Right. Uh, they were all uh, medium-sized uh, trucking fleets. Define uh, medium size, just so I can. So yeah, there are different tiers of uh, trucking fleets. Um, there are giants, of course, uh, like I don't know JB Hunt and uh, uh, FedEx and uh, Werner, for instance. Those kind of companies have more than like ten thousand trucks in their fleets, so that put puts them in the tier one category. But there are only eleven of them. Oh, gotcha. When it comes to trucking industry uh, in the U.S., there are, if I recall correctly, more than 70,000 trucking businesses, including like mom and pops uh, or a single driver, act, uh, owner operator kind of businesses as well. That's the majority. That's like you own the truck and like you you're own the truck going and with then, it. Yeah, yeah. You, you operate it as well. You are your own employee and you just like go to load boards and whatnot, uh, get yourself in, uh, put a trailer behind you and then keep going. So that's how you operate. Uh, but there are also, as I said, like tier ones, more than uh, 10,000 trucks in their fleets, but there are only 11 of them. Uh, and then there are a bunch of tier two and tier three companies, like hundreds of them with yeah. 
uh, between, I don't know, 5,000 to 10,000 trucks, between 1,000 to 5,000 trucks. Yeah. I, I don't remember the exact categorization or exact breakdown uh, uh, points, but that's roughly how You can how have 9,000 trucks and still not be considered a big company. Yeah, so I I, I don't know <laughs> the, the exact cutoff, but that's uh, yeah. 10,000 is the cutoff, if I recall correctly. Yeah. But um, the thing is, uh, again, like 70,000 or so trucking businesses in the U.S. alone, uh, it's a highly kind of skewed distribution. Most of uh, those businesses are like smaller side, uh, owner operator kind of side, but a hefty amount in the middle uh, corresponds to those tier two, tier uh, three, like mid-sized companies yeah. with a few hundred to a few thousand trucks in their fleets. And uh, usually uh, those companies are uh, owned by or managed by really uh, forward-looking kind of, uh, uh, how to say, business savvy people who want, want to also grow their businesses. Like they, if they could penetrate into new, new markets, if, could, if they could make their operations a bit more efficient, then they could capture a bit more profit or a bit more market share and whatnot. So instead of like- They could be one of the 11 or 12 now. They could be one of the 11. They could actually steal uh, the, the business of some of those like uh, giants uh, because the giants are giants and they don't have a lot more motivation to grow even bigger. Yeah, but these sense. kind of slightly smaller companies have that kind of a They're motivation. Hungrier. Yeah, they are hungrier. They, they have that kind of motivation as well. That's why they are also willing to um, try these kind of technologies and integrate uh, these kind of technologies into their uh, overall workflows as quickly as possible so they can they can uh, get some like competitive edge uh, uh, against those giants or, or their, their peers. So yeah, that's... Uh, Going back to locomotion's uh, industry first kind of uh, achievements, that was one of those. Like we had four of those customers uh, uh, that uh, that we worked very close with, and we were looking at a a backlog of uh, more than thirty one hundred trucks to be delivered oh, wow. in, a, in in the next few years um, with our um, human guided autonomy technology. So that was another thing that we did when we analyzed the business aspect of it. Again, at the end of the day. We are talking about autonomy. Uh, autonomy is not a fully solved problem. Sure. Uh, the Especially on road. Indeed, on road autonomy in unstructured environments or uh, environments with high uncertainty uh, could be coming from the environmental factors, could be coming from the other human drivers uh, that you are sharing the roads with, <laughs> right? So wherever there is humans, there is chaos, there is, uh, there is unpredictability. Um, so most of the difficulties that autonomy systems are having uh, come from the higher cognitive functions, um, like being able to uh, run reasoning processes, being able to semantically understand what's going on around you, being able to predict just from even like a single snapshot what may happen. Um, so those higher level cognitive functions are still missing in robots. It's not about being able to classify a pixel as a stop sign or not. It's uh, a lot more than that. And unfortunately, robots to date still don't have that kind of high level cognitive capabilities. That's why we thought um, a human in the loop and human guided autonomy approach would be uh, the most natural uh, and most successful first step on, on our path to fully autonomous systems. That's why we introduced uh, human guided autonomous convoys where the, the first truck would be operated by a human driver and the following truck would be following that lead autonomously. So thereby you would, you would tap into the strengths of both entities, both humans on the higher level cognitive uh, function side of things and to robots on the lower level, uh, super precise control and super human reaction times kind of fronts. Um, so yeah. That was our unique solution to the problem. That makes a lot of sense. So obviously you guys were convoying two trucks, but was the plan to eventually get like 10 of them going or? Not quite. Uh, yeah. So in theory, you could actually have a, a road train. That's what they are called. <laughs> um, but there are a few problems with road trains. Um, there is kind of a technical problem as well, even though it's, it's a, a solvable problem. Uh, so. I think the more technical term uh, that will go with that would be uh, string stability. 
uh, you can think of it as like the the oscillation and accordion kind of effect uh, accordion accordion kind of effect oh interesting longitudinal uh, uh, axis and and kind of oscillations on the lateral axis as well so when you have uh, your chain of vehicles essentially ultimately following the the first uh, link in the chain uh, whatever error the first link may have gets propagated down that chain with with some addition of additional error as well coming from the onboard sensors and computing uh, uh, delays and such on the on the following agents and as a result by the end uh, by, by, by the time you arrive at the end of your chain your last link will be all over the place and it will all be oscillating trying to compensate and all that stuff it's it's, it's a traditional uh, kind of delay or latency compensation kind of a problem so if you cannot properly synchronize your system with the latency uh, you will end up with oscillations yeah makes sense so it's solvable uh, you could actually uh, inform your uh, kind of following links ab directly about the the location or or whatnot like, like the, the state uh, information of your ultimate leader uh, through vehicle to vehicle communication systems and whatnot to eliminate that delay uh, as much as possible uh, and address that uh, string stability problem that way but if even if you solve the technical uh, part of the, the, the problem there are some other non-technical perhaps uh, issues so <laughs> though we are talking about long vehicles right so uh, each uh, truck is about like 70 feet long that's pretty long that's pretty long so when you actually chain a few of them together before you know it you'll be looking at a half mile long uh, road train <laughs> and in the US highway system every exit is pretty much a mile away from each other oh no so uh, like people won't be able to merge into highways people won't be able to exit highways because of that road train of, of uh, trucks following each other from I don't know a, a few tens of uh, feet um, very very close to each other and I'm sure if somebody does cut in, that probably screws up your road train because now you can't track the truck in front of you as easily. You can actually. Uh, in our system lo at Locomation, um, our trucks uh, uh, would be connected to each other through kind of a multimodal connection oh, uh, paradigm. Uh, so the follower trucks would be detecting and tracking the lead truck through their onboard sensing and computation, as well as being excuse me, being connected to it uh, through vehicle-to-vehicle -vehicle communication, radio communication, dedicated yeah. radio link. Can you uh, say at all what the uh, sensors look like that track the truck in front from the previous truck? Or? So uh, since we, uh, we were formulating this uh, human-guided autonomy concept as a step, stepping stone uh, along our path to full autonomy, uh, our vehicles were actually retrofitted with sensors that would allow full autonomy uh, operations. Uh, and as a result, uh, we would be looking at pretty much the, the standard gang of sensors, uh, cameras, lidars, and, and radars. Makes sense. And uh, we would use a fusion of uh, each of those modalities to detect and track our leader and the surrounding traffic elements as well. Cool. So if one day when we removed uh, the, the lead vehicle we would still be able to use the same set of sensors and same set of uh, autonomy algorithms uh, same set of underlying uh, control algorithms and such to essentially drive a fully autonomous truck that was that was the roadmap that's really cool yeah so i think i think uh, we had a solid plan there for sure yeah that makes a lot of sense i mean if you're going to go to the effort to build something semi-autonomous and you can use those same sensors right for full autonomy like why not the thing is uh, you don't want to overdo that either right so you can actually over engineer something been there right so uh then all of a sudden you'll be looking at a system that is not economically feasible uh, unit economics are broken and as a result you would never uh, generate meaningful revenues or profits off of it yeah because uh, it doesn't make sense to buy it's one too ever. expensive you won't yeah. be able to sell it you won't be able to and again the more number of sensors you have the more number of potential points of failure you introduce to the system so at any given time the likelihood of something failing increases yeah so there's that's more things to break indeed so it's actually a good practice to try to come up with something 
minimal yet safe uh, that would make your unit economics much better that would make your overall engineering systems engineering effort manufacturing efforts a lot more affordable and doable uh, and overall architecture a lot more elegant as well right one other thing is some some companies in the field also tried doing that which in my opinion does not work uh, is first starting with something like ADAS uh, advanced driver assistance systems Thanks and for then the acronym <laughs> and then uh, trying to uh, evolve it into an autonomy system but the thing is those two solutions have completely different architectural requirements you cannot actually start with one and and uh, convert it to the other one very concrete example is by definition an ADAS system uh, has a D has a like driver driver yeah. in, in in the equation right and the the fallback is to the driver yep. if the ADAS system stops working there is a driver to take over whereas in an autonomy system there is no driver to take over yeah that all of a sudden means you, you are looking at a different architecture uh, you yeah. need to actually consider redundancy this and that like all the failure modes and, and whatnot and uh, be able to uh, take mitigation uh, actions like in the form of minimum risk maneuvers and whatnot so it's a completely different architecture you cannot start with ADAS and evolve it into uh, into autonomy but it sounds like you could evolve an autonomous system into ADAS from that description you could yes yeah. Yeah, a, a, an autonomous system is a superset, definitely. Right, and the ADAS is the subset. Subset, yeah. indeed. Yeah, agreed. Indeed. Yeah, that's, that makes sense. And I've definitely seen examples of that that I won't name. <laughs> but, <laughs> yeah, for sure. I mean, yeah. I, I think we all know, you know, what that looks like. Right, right, indeed. Yeah, cool. So um, I guess when did you decide to um, to start kind of moving away from locomation and what did that what did that process look like? Um, yeah, uh, well, locomation uh, uh, was acquired. Uh, Congratulations! Uh, thank you so much. Um, so as we all know, uh, we are still going through some really rough. Uh, patches I guess and bumps uh, economically globally and as a result large companies and small ones alike uh, they are forced to take measures to continue doing their businesses they are doing pivots they are doing um, headcount adjustments uh, right yeah so uh, as a relatively small company we also had to go through those processes. Yeah. Uh, we had to reduce our headcount and, and such. And when you... Sorry. Uh, no, I think that's that's the uh, that's the nature of the business. Yeah. Right? So that's how companies stay alive and, and keep going. Yeah. Well, it's like one of my friends put it in the way where like, you know, and I mentioned this earlier, but like if a mouse gets, you know an arm stuck in a glue trap or something, they'll like chew their arm off so that they can get out of the trap and keep living. In, indeed, indeed. People do that too, you know, when they, in, when they get stuck. Indeed, yes. So um, that's, that's how business works. Um, that may sound a little heartless and harsh, but uh, that's the, the, that's the, the reality. Hard, hard reality yeah. of business. So, um, and we were, as I said, uh, already a super efficient super nimble super uh agile company again uh with, with kind of peanuts money uh, in, the, in the industry standards and very small number of people it, at, at uh, its peak locomotion reached about 140 headcount which is uh, pretty much like an order or two uh, <laughs> of magnitudes less than some of the players in the AV industry. Yeah, thinking of Argo, um, Aurora, Uber, Waymo, ITG, uh, Waymo. Yeah, um, Aurora, right? So they are all um, thousands of people. Yeah. Uh, so with that kind of limited uh, resources, we achieved, as I said, a, a, a lot of industry first. Uh, and uh, I think we accomplished a lot. I'm super proud of our team, our entire um, founding team, executive team, uh, and our engineers, everyone. 
every single uh, member of the company. Uh, we did really great work. Agree. Thank you so much. Uh, but again, when all the boats are being rocked by external forces, that, that kind of hurricane, tornado, whatever you want to call it, still going on again. Uh, the economy has not recovered yet. And we had to take measures. We had to kind of uh, reallocate certain uh, things, reprioritize certain things. But of course, those kind of external disturbances uh, also disturb your longer term plans and, and whatnot. Sure. So with that, when we looked at the uh, the situation, if you will, the optimal path forward was for Locomation to continue its mission and its legacy uh, with with the acquirer's uh, resources, yeah, if makes you will. Sense. Uh, so uh, that's why we had to make that kind of decision to to sell Locomation. Yeah, I mean that just strikes me as like mission over ego, right? You know. In, indeed, indeed. Yeah, the the legacy, the mission still uh, continues. Uh, we are hoping to see um, the the fruits of our work. I still believe personally that the very first viable uh, autonomous tracking application is going to be in the form of convoys before we see fully autonomous trucks i still believe fully autonomous systems uh, on road systems i should say are still years away uh even though off-road systems have been around for for a very long time and oh. i've been fortunate enough to work on some of them nice uh, <laughs> but uh the on-road ones are still kind of early yeah and I mean, I've also had the privilege of getting to work on some off-road autonomy systems, and I will say it's easier. I mean... Yes and no. Yes and no. Well, I think... I mean, it's a more... I don't want to say forgiving environment because a lot of the stuff can go wrong, but you can have more regulated environments off-road, I guess. Like, I did some work in the mining uh, sector where, I mean, you know, you can have your employees at a mine wear RFID badges that you can track yeah. them by. You're never going to get civilians to do that on the side of the road. That doesn't make any sense. Right, right. Uh, um, I mean... You uh, can't get the cooperation of every car on the road. Like, right. and, you know, bicycles, pedestrians, deer running across the road. Right. So what you are describing is uh, pretty much like the quintessential... Uh, mobile robotics problem, right? So uncertainty is the biggest issue in mobile robotics. When you remove uncertainty, all of a sudden every, everybody's happy. Like look at the factory robots uh, in the form of, let's say, manipulator arms when they are working in cages and such. There is nothing that can actually impact their overall like, um, operation except for them internally breaking. Yeah, right? I've so, heard some stories that are kind of funny about that happening. But, right. Yeah. Or look at, uh, let's say, Amazon robots, uh, those uh, robots that actually move shelves around. Yeah, the uh, Kiva. Kiva uh, systems uh, continuation as Amazon ro robotics, right? So uh, the robots are pretty much working in human-free zones. Uh, they have their reset points, like every so often they have barcodes or, or QR codes on the floor. Everything is like 90 degrees from each other, two meters away from each other or whatnot. Uh, so it, they're operating on a grid. Uh, there are no unexpected things, no humans stepping in, in their way or no, I don't know, geese crossing. <laughs> or whatnot, right? so, uh, they are super happy. They are working like clockwork. When you start introducing a little bit of uncertainty and un unexpected things, mobile robots start breaking because, again, as I mentioned uh, earlier in the conversation, all of a sudden that requires higher levels of cognitive functions. You cannot solve uh, that problem with uh, more like industrial automation, kind of more robotic approaches. All of a sudden you have to inject a lot more advanced AI. And unfortunately, the state of AI is not there to handle that kind of stuff. Like that, yeah. that kind of brings us closer to artificial general intelligence realm. And artificial general int intelligence has been a, a re an open research problem for the past seven to five years. So, so this so. isn't what is artificial general intelligence? Because I'm not much of an AI guy. Like, is that? Yeah. So I mean, art you can think of artificial general intelligence as, as the name suggests, an artificial intelligence that can actually solve any general problem, uh, as opposed to being like specialized. We've had specialized 
uh, AI systems for a very long time now. Expert systems and I don't know, optical character recognizers and this and that or spam filters. Like they have a, they have a single task. They are trained for that. They are built for that. They got one job to do. They got one job to do and they can do that. Whereas um, a, an AGI would be as flexible as a human being. Like okay, given a problem, uh, use whatever is required to solve that problem. Like analogies, uh, I don't know, simulation, mental simulation, uh, reasoning, common sense. Like bring all of those things together. Common sense is something that we cannot even define yeah, as a mathematical equation, right? So we cannot. It's difficult to put into words as a. We person. don't know I how mean, the natural yeah, like, version actually works. That, that, yeah. Thereby, we cannot implement the artificial version of it. So, uh, and that's the biggest problem. I mean, we we maybe don't realize uh, in our day-to-day -day lives, but we we make use of a ton of common sense in our everyday kind of living. So, yeah. but it's interesting because common sense isn't even universal because like. What might be common sense for me isn't necessarily common sense for you because we were raised in different environments and yeah, I mean, so I was exposed to things that built my model of like the thing that you know if I were to go through that situation again, oh, I'm not gonna walk under a piano being raised by a wire because I saw <laughs> that guy get crushed by one. You know, that's common sense. Or, yeah, yeah. Know, like, I mean, so that's a great example as well, right? So what you do when you see that kind of a scene is. Well, you segment the scene into its objects. Right? There's a, uh, there is a, a piano hanging off of like a rope, steel rope or whatever, above the ground, which means that it's not contacting the ground, which means if the rope breaks at some point, because of gravity, it will fall. When it falls, piano is a heavy object. It will actually create a lot of damage. It will crash you as a human. So by just looking at that scene, even... If you saw like a picture of it, a photograph of it, not even just like seeing it live, you would be able to run that reasoning process to associate all those like spatiotemporal semantic things about that scene, what could go wrong, etc. You'd be able to mentally simulate that because can you you may have seen it in a cartoon or you know physics or whatnot. So you bring a bunch of different bits of information to synthesize a potential future scenario and as a result you take action accordingly you don't go underneath it you kind of walk around it right so that kind of sophisticated reasoning and and synthesis of bits and pieces of information coming from different experiences that it's not something that modern day ai systems can achieve it's still an open research qu uh, question and driving happens to be a, a problem that actually requires that kind of mental flexibility, that kind of cognitive flexibility. So that's why it's not going to be solved anytime soon. That's interesting. I did not know that. <laughs> <laughs> that's my personal opinion, at least. Yeah. No, I mean, I, you're probably right. I, I totally drank the Kool-Aid at CMU um, when, you know, they, you were doing your postdoctoral work when I was getting my master's and I was just like, oh, we're going to have self-driving cars in like three years from now. And this would have been 2015. And Yeah, it's always uh, the next month or next year. Yeah, uh, exactly. Yeah, eventually it will happen. Eventually, yeah. I mean, uh, it, it's also a pattern, right? So it's also a, how to say, like things don't work until they do. Yeah. And that's when breakthroughs happen. Uh, eventually it will happen. Uh, but I don't think that eventuality is next Monday. I wish... I wish that that were the case because, again, as we talked at the beginning of the conversation, there are real problems, real pain points that uh, that kind of a capable AI system would be able to address immediately uh, and make everyone happy, hopefully. But the reality is that, again, if, at, at least as an engineer, as a scientist, if you cannot even formulate the problem, how can you solve it? Um, we are not gamblers we are not in the business of i don't know uh, crossing our fingers and and again i i have a lot of uh, experience uh, kind of as uh, as an applied machine learning uh, person myself as well so i know the the uh, strengths and weaknesses the limits of uh, that technology so maybe just to bring a bit clear to my earlier statement 
uh, I'm not a, a believer of like uh, silver bullets. I don't think there is going to be one magical. So you would say a general purpose AI would be a silver bullet. The, no, I mean, let, let's say neural network, right? So yeah. some people actually expect a lot out of a, a deep neural network. They think that um, you can throw a bunch of data at it, cross your fingers and hope that it will learn and be able to solve the problem that you are chasing after. As long as you have a big enough data set, yeah, like but it'll you work. Have, but you have no idea how it's actually solving it. So, yeah. because you cannot even define it. Of course, there are also, there are also kind of methods, uh, very, very neat methods uh, to address uh, issues like uh, when, when you cannot mathematically formulate a problem, you can use methods like inverse reinforcement learning or learning from demonstration or whatnot to actually capture the essence of things or the, the underlying objective function of things from an expert demonstrating the thing to you and then you can train your models to come like essentially behave like that expert does but without knowing why why that system is behaving that way anyways it's kind of uh, reconstructing that objective that hidden latent objective function but without being aware of it so because i'm just kind of dumb with ai what is an objective function ah, objective function is actually like a mathematical term right so you uh, you are trying to either maximize or minimize a a value represented by that multidimensional surface uh, your, being your objective function. That might function. not even be a function that you can put into mathematical terms. That might be something that comes out of your neural net or your. Well, I mean, if you look, well, I guess that would be a mathematical term. Indeed, yeah. yeah. So if you if you just put yeah. like a magnifying glass on a neural network, or those like millions of parameters, what it is is essentially it's a super high dimensional function it's like if you doing a bunch of math yeah you you, yeah. you you can as humans we can only visualize things in in three dimensions uh, so if you had a way to kind of map that super high dimensional space in uh, to to like three dimensions it's a lot of time with a pencil. even that yeah. then you would actually see a bunch of like hills and valleys and whatnot it's super super complicated function that's what what it learns at the end of the day and that's why you can say well when you're training it you say if it's xyz then it's like the, the result should be Z or the, the result should be W or whatever. Uh, that's kind of a supervised learning thing, right? And then once you have your model, then you can ask, hey, what is this X, Y, Z? And based on whatever it learned, it <laughs> can give you a W based on that. Uh, but again, at, at the end of the day, what it does is learning that high dimensional uh, function. And when you look, uh, look at it from like an, uh, an optimization or objective function point of view, you are looking for hills or valleys, whatever you are trying to do, <laughs> uh, that are the highest or the, or the lowest in, in that kind of multidimensional space. Cool. I still don't fully understand it, but I understand it better than I did. <laughs> awesome. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm more than happy to give you a, a lecture on that at some point as well. Yeah, I might actually take you up on that. Awesome. <laughs> yeah. Is that is that something we want to do now, or is that something you want to save for like when we have a whiteboard? Yeah, and, let's and save it for, for a whiteboard, more time and more alcohol, I guess. Yeah, sounds good to me. <laughs> <laughs> cheers, by the way. Ah, oh, cheers. Yeah. It is good hanging out with you. It's it's been a long time since I feel like I've just spent this much time kind of just talking and and you know shooting the shit as it were. Um, for people listening, like Tekken and I used to spend a lot of late evenings, uh, like just in the personal robotics lab at Carnegie Mellon. That's so right. There was Herb, and then I didn't do anything with Herb. There was that little Jaco arm that. Right. It was actually a Miko arm. Oh, Miko um, arm. My bad. <laughs> yeah, by Kinova Robotics. Uh, so the project's name was Ada, uh, Assistive Dexterous Arm. It was a uh, wheelchair mounted um, semi autonomous robotic arm to help um, elderly and disabled with their activities of daily living. So that was kind of the, the context of the project. Yeah. And one of the things that we were working on was being able to lift a glass of water and help somebody drink that. That's so. right, indeed. So yeah, that's uh, like drinking a glass of water is a big part of the, the activities of daily living set, essentially, in the life of everyone, and especially in the life of um, uh, disabled as well, depending on their disability levels. So that's why being able to use a robotic arm to 
autonomously or semi-autonomously bring that glass of water to the mouth of, of the user uh, without spilling it uh, yep. would be an important task. <laughs> task Easier than doing yeah, it with indeed. spilling it. Indeed, that's, <laughs> that's what Spencer was working on pretty much. Indeed. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah, thanks. No, it was, it was fun. Um, you mentioned we were both kind of night owls back then and would, would sort of stay up yeah multiple days in a row uh not really doing that anymore <laughs> yeah 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 so it's it's kind of interesting um my my days at cmu definitely had a lot of uh all-nighters and such um i i was friends with all the uh uh building personnel security guards and and janitors and such because those were the people that you would see at i don't know 4 a.m in the morning nice uh in any kind of floor uh, of the building and they would ask me like do you not have a home <laughs> why, <laughs> why are you still here uh, but yeah i i had a lot of fun i had a blast uh, at cmu definitely there's uh there's someone i worked with for a while um one of the students i met at the robotics club um who i recruited for some of the projects that ska was working on and um i think I referred him over to the Field Robotics Center. He worked for, I believe, Red for a little bit, and then he went and worked for Raytheon and then NASA, and then now he's getting a PhD at the University of Michigan. That's awesome. But he lived in one of the labs at CMU. Like, he <laughs> legit didn't pay rent or, like, <laughs> buy a house. He just lived in a lab. Had the life and when of he a was at NASA, student. yeah, no, but when he was at NASA, <laughs> like, after being a grad student, he bought a van um, with money he made working on SKA projects <laughs> and lived in that. <laughs> so, that's, that's awesome. I love it when people can do that. Like I, I admire the discipline it takes to be able to um, like sleep in your car or sleep in a van or sleep in an office. Like I, I have another friend who um, he rented a machine shop like for – maybe $700 a month in like, you know, kind of a, you know, not the best neighborhood in Pittsburgh. And, um, he slept in his car. He had, mm -hmm. he made custom mounts for like a mattress and, and just lived in there. And, wow. um, yeah. And I think he would like try to not get caught doing it cause his lease didn't allow it. And so he like had like a shower he would rig up inside the machine shop, like in a sink. And then <laughs> he would like take a circle around the block before he'd walk to his car so like the security guard wouldn't notice him just walking right to his car and then coming back in in the morning. Interesting. That's yeah. admirable. <laughs> yeah. yeah, for sure. Now the uh, the stoicism, I think, to be able to do that is is what I'm jealous of. Like the like I don't know. I mean, I I don't live in luxury, but I also like don't live in my car. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. Uh, sometimes I mean, you, you never know. Everyone everyone has a different uh, story, right? Yeah, so, for sure. Uh, Maybe a preference. It may be something that they they are forced to. Uh, by preference, I mean I don't know. They may be a minimalist by nature, by heart. Yeah. So they may not be desiring anything more than what is absolutely essential to yeah. survive. Uh, but uh, it may also be, again, some external yeah. factors. Well, I, I think these them. guys were minimalists because I mean they yeah. definitely were like earning more money than you know they could they could have lived in. That, a, that that's a lifestyle. A that, that's a lifestyle. I mean there is this concept called uh, uh, miniature houses, tiny houses, right? Yeah. So people are living in tiny little spaces uh, and having a lot of fun with that. So um, I think that's that's a thing to to respect. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah the tiny home thing is interesting too. Um, I, I have a few friends that are into that and. I feel like the choices you have to make, you know, with like, you know, I've only got, you know, 200 square feet and how am I going to have that function as a bathroom, a living room, a bedroom and a kitchen, you know, and like yeah, that's, constraints always make you creative, right? Or maybe like 80 square feet, but yeah, for sure. <laughs> yeah. That's, that's the very definition of, um, engineering, uh, delivering something, uh, uh, subject to some constraints, yeah. money, time, other kind of resources. Uh, Wait, uh, building an air, aerospace? Indeed, yeah, so any kind of constraint. Uh, so that's the very definition of engineering. And uh, that one of the things I, I like about, I guess, those tiny houses and, and I don't know, RVs and such is the overall functionality, like how they maximize uh, the available volume, available space by either, I don't know, making things retractable or multifunction and, and whatnot. So That's the beauty of it. Right, yeah. so I mean, that, that's definitely exciting that tingles my my uh 
engineer brain for sure <laughs> now, I, I years ago maybe four years ago um SKA developed a proposal for a transforming office space that could go from being um, an event space to a conference room to like a um, multi-desk workspace, like co-working. And um, we never got to build it. Uh, the client didn't bite on that proposal, but um, that would have been fun to make. Like, yeah, I, it sounds like I, I like the idea of doing that on a larger scale. Yeah, and mechatronically transforming. So like, you know, with, with buttons, you know, you could make it do this stuff with actuators and that's so, awesome yeah, yeah that sounds like fun yeah i was excited for it but you know <laughs> maybe we'll get to do it at some point maybe yeah cool all right so um what's what's on the horizon for you uh what do you what are you doing next uh well i'm an entrepreneur at the end of the day uh there are many problems uh waiting to be solved uh so looking at uh, a few stuff in the background uh, assessing uh, their viability and um, and uh, I guess excitement uh, levels and uh, we'll see we'll see hopefully soon uh, I and, and uh, anyone who's interested will know what, what I'll be up to next cool well, I think that's a good place to cut it um, did, anything you want to plug uh no, I think I, I think that has been a, a wonderful chat. Thank you so much again for uh, inviting me. Uh, I, it's been uh, it's been a lot of fun. It's always fun to catch up with you and talk talk with you. So, um, yeah, thanks again, and and I hope this uh, this was also uh, kind of useful for your listeners. Maybe they can grab a few insights uh, out of our conversation. Yeah, I think they will. I appreciate you coming on. I always enjoy our hangs as well. And thanks for doing this, Dakin. Of course. Thanks for joining us today. If you made it this far, chances are you'll like other episodes too. Collaborative with Spencer Krauss is available on YouTube, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Pocket Casts, and Radio Public. Subscribe today to get notified when the latest episodes release and support the channel. Collaborative with Spencer Krauss is sponsored by SKA Custom Robots and Machines. If you're in the market for robotics contract engineering services, please consider hiring SK Custom Robots and Machines. They sponsor this podcast and they solve some of the toughest engineering challenges in the world. SK Custom Robots and Machines can be found at ska.solutions. Thanks again and see you on the next one.